All right, we are live. Thank you, live, and thank you for joining us with another week of Good Medicine Way. We have an excellent speaker. He's there with some instruments behind him, and Larry Gent. I'm so excited to hear what he has to say. So, I am on my ancestral lands, the Diné people, the lands of the Diné people, or some people might know them as the Navajo people. So, we are excited for what we have to share for you with you. And so I'm going to give it to Eshe for our four directional prayers. Thank you, Preston. All right. Um, so we're going to start from the east and then work our way around and then go uh, up and down to the earth. Um, this one's a little different than the one I usually do. I wanted to try to find something a little different. So bear with me and bear with my cough. I'm still getting over this uh, infection, whatever it is. Um, we turn to the east, the direction of the rising sun, new beginnings, springtime and the element of fire. We thank you, sacred mystery, for how you are revealed through the wild mercy of every morning when the sun, our guiding light, Warming fire and inspiration for a new day rises yet again. And we acknowledge the shadow side of fire as it can cause destruction. Our prayers and activism are with and behind those whose lives, human and non-human, are being impacted by forest fires even today. We look to the East in gratitude and honor for this new day and to all the wisdom within this direction. We now turn to the south, the direction of the powerful sun and all of its force, growing awareness, summertime and the element of the warming and fertile earth. We thank you, great one, for how you are revealed to the earth, the place from which life is seeded and grown. We look to the south in gratitude and honor for the work of this day, the particular purpose for which we would have been created and all the wisdom within the southern direction. We now turn to the west, the direction of the setting sun, courage and introspection, becoming and belonging, autumn and the element of water. We thank you, sacred mystery, for how you are revealed through the watershed, seeing how we too are meant to be held within the flow of the essence of life. We look to the West in gratitude and honor for one another day well lived. And as the sun sets below the horizon and yellow leaves fall to the earth, we lean into the grace and wisdom of what is for us when we let go and allow ourselves to be part of the flow. We turn to the north, the direction of the sun at the coldest and darkest, <clears throat> knowing of the elders wintertime and the elements of the air. We thank you, sacred one, for how you are revealed through the air, through the breath, the wind, that you blow wisdom through the wintertime air like a generational seed. that will become planted in the coming months of spring. We look to the north in gratitude and honor for the cover and quiet of night, for the inspiration of dreams and for the much needed sacred rhythm of dormancy and quiet time in darkness. We reach to the cosmos, the home of the planets, the stars, the galaxies, the creative cosmic reach of the divine spirit who flared all things forth. We thank you, sacred mystery, for how you are revealed to the principles of the universe diversity, inferior, interiority, and communion. We expand our reach upwards and remembering and reclaiming our oneness with all beings in the sacred community of expansive life. We now reach down to the earth, the sacred land from which all planetary life is derived. Here, we humbly acknowledge the sacramentality and revelatory nature of our planet. Here, we acknowledge that we are each guests upon the lands of other peoples, indigenous communities who have lived upon these various lands for time and memorial. We thank you, Great One, for the Earth's energy and nourishment for all the plants, trees, animals, and humans. We acknowledge the inherent dignity of all beings and the divine presence that is made manifest through the Earth and all of her regulatory systems. We look to the Earth in gratitude and reciprocity. In Thank you, Eshe. Um, before I hand it over to our uh, singers, and I forgot to introduce that 
Good Medicine Way is on the Tewa lands, which is included of the Sandia, the Aceta, the Santa Ana, the, San, the Laguna, and also the hunting lands and many tribal lands of different other tribes. Just so excited and forgot to tell you that. But that's where Good, um, good Medicine Way is at. It's in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So let's have the Grovers take it away and give us a blessing. All right. We do a Robbie Robertson song for our group song today. It's a pretty, it's a pretty easy one, so hopefully we all can sing along without an issue. But it is a new one for us. We've done it before, but it's been a while. Secret of the train. 
Thank you, Grovers. Thank you. Yes, we all appreciate that. Um, next up, we have a creation insights and it'll be from Leia Grover and um, Casey Church. But before I hand it off, I'm going to say something, but more like sing something. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jesus. Happy birthday to you. And I'll let them explain more about it. Why I explain Jesus' birthday. Yeah, got a double birthday. Double today. birthday. Double. Yeah, we're, we're official. This is the first day that we are ever grandparents in our whole life. About three hours ago, Winifred Filizola was born. Woo! Hey, wow, awesome. So I got to start talking like a grandpa now. <laughs> Well, you young whippersnappers, back in my children are God's best idea. Oh, <laughs> All right, anyway. Well, did you want to do your September is the, the real day thing first, or? or uh... oh, I'll, I'll step in, yeah. I'll just share, share a little bit. People say, why, why do you celebrate now? Why did you have the happy birthday song? You know, it's September. It's not uh, December 25th. Uh, and through all, all my study and through theologians teaching me as well, is that if you take the time and you research it, uh, you find out that Jesus uh, was born more like in September than on the day of the you know winter solstice, which kind of coincided with the pagans' belief that the sun is being reborn and now is coming back to life again. And that seemed to connect really well with the, the people of those days when they were, uh, Christianity was just coming into their world. And rather than change, change it and make it fit a day that they didn't have any connection with, like, you know, September, why not have it connect with a day that we already relate to when we're st we believe that the sun and now the Son of God is now being born. So why not connect it with there? So th basically that is how we got December 25th as a day that we celebrate, uh, you know, nowadays the birth of Christ. When, uh, you know, with Good Medicine Way, we try to show that th there are other teachings, not just ones that are culturally adapted from the European ways, but you can look at the real life and follow follow the theology and the teachings and know that it was probably somewhere in September. We don't know the exact date. That'd be nice to know. I always tell you, say, why don't we know the exact date? You know, because Mary was there and uh, it's got to be written down somewhere, the exact date when he was born. But, you know, we're all, we all know our, we all know our birthday because uh, we can look at our license and it says right on there, you were born, you were born. You can look at your birth certificate and know when you were born. You know, it's all there, but Jesus doesn't have an exact date. But somehow they made an exact date with December 25th. So just, uh, just to put some little tweak in your mind there to let's start looking and studying it and uh, know our theology and know our history, our Christian history. All right, Leah. All right, well, years a few years ago before Terry Wildman and gang came out with the FNB, they uh, had the account of Creator Set Free's birth all done up in a book called The Birth of the Chosen One. And here's a section called Humble Birth. When the time drew close. Mm -hmm. Let's see, show them the cover. Oh, yeah, let's they, they see. see. How close can we get that? Who's the easiest person that could walk over there? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's something that you can it. still order, maybe. Da -da -da. Reflection. Yeah. There we go. And a little bit about this this book. This was before First Nations version came out, <clears throat> and this was kind of like the kickoff that sparked the idea for Terry Wildman to take it the next step and and do a a, a book of the Bible. And so it really, that was a stepping stone to, you know, what we now use in our First Nations version. So, Leah? 
All right, here's a section called Humble Birth. When the time drew close for bitter tears to have her child, the government of the people of iron ordered that a census should be taken. All the people were required to travel to their ancestral homeland to register. He gives sons and bitter tears, set out on a long journey to Bethlehem, the village of their ancestor, much loved one, the great chief. The journey took several long days and cold nights as they traveled over high hills and through the dry desert. When they arrived tired and weary, they entered the crowded village. The time for bitter tears to have her child was upon her, but no place could be found in the lodging house. So he gave sons found a stable where it was warm and dry. There she gave birth to her son. They wrapped him in a warm, soft blanket and laid him on a baby board. Then they placed him on a bed of straw in a feeding trough. That night, in the fields nearby, sheep herders were keeping watch over their sheep. Suddenly a great light from above was shining all around them. A spirit messenger from Creator appeared to them. They shook with fear and trembled as the messenger said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will be for all nations. Today in the village of much loved one, a great chief has been born. He's the chosen one. The messenger continued, This is how you'll know him. You'll find the child wrapped in a blanket and lying in a feeding trough. Suddenly, a great number of spirit warriors appeared, giving thanks to Creator, saying, All honor to the one above us all, and on earth let there be peace to all who stay under the shadow of his wings. When the spirit warriors returned to the world above, the sheep herders said to each other, Let us go and see this great thing the Creator has told to us. So they hurried to the village of chief much loved one and found the child just as they were told, lying in a feeding trough. They left with glad hearts and began to tell everyone what they had seen. All who heard their story were amazed. The sheep herders returned to their fields, giving thanks to the great spirit for the wonders they'd seen and heard. Bitter tears kept all these things hidden in the medicine pouch of her heart and wondered what all this could mean. <clears throat> yeah, and if you wanted to follow that, that same verse, you can look that up also in Luke, in the First Nations version, Luke, the second chapter. So a lot of those words came and inspired the First Nations version. Preston? Thank you, guys. Um, very interesting to learn about how we can see and perceive the difference of Jesus' birthday. But next up, we have another thing from the First Nations version is the way we take the Lord's Prayer. So let's give that to Leah McCoo. Actually, or are we going to do that? Uh, um, Leah, Leah McCoo, uh, because she's a what did she say? She was officially cantorial soloist. Cantor, yeah, she can't call herself a cantor because she <laughs> hasn't been to Yeshiva. Ordained, really. but uh, but anyway, so she's she's canting at various Yom Kippur events today. Um, so we're just going to uh, read the prayer together. You can feel free to sign along if you remember any of those. All right, here we go. Creator sets free, shows us how to pray. O Great Spirit, our Father from above, we honor your name as sacred and holy. Bring your good road to us, where the beauty of your ways in the spirit world above is reflected in the earth below. Provide for us day by day the elk the buffalo the salmon the corn the squash and the wild rice all the things we need for each day release us from the things we have done wrong in the same way we release others who have done wrong to us guide us away from the things that tempt us to stray from your good road and set us free from the evil one and his worthless ways. I hope may it be so. Thank you, Brian.
next up we're gonna have our smoke signals and so get ready to find those smoke signals on top of where you are at and we are posted we aren't going to be needing you to share your first smoke signals and also if you want to share smoke signals you don't have to bring out your sage and sage bundles you can actually just raise your, your hand on the zoom or if you're on other platforms just type it into the comments and we'll try to share it with other people so take it away take it away leah all right. Well, kind of a cool thing about Winifred, her name means Holy Blessed Reconciliation. And today, Yom Kippur is all about forgiveness and reconciliation. So it's pretty cool at Yom Kippur, you know, pointing that back to the most important birthday of, that we're observing today, you know, atonement, Jesus. I, I've even heard Jews describe that how, how you understand what atonement means is it's just at one minute uh, when, when he took our place, you know, for our sins. He was, he was, you know, making the payment for what we should have paid. So, so it's quite a day, quite a day for both births. But uh, the announcement to make, yeah, yeah. The announcement is uh, inviting all the ladies, of course, to our book discussion every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. And we're going through Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Uh, a combination of indigenous Potawatomi uh, views of how nature is our relative, combined with her Western PhD in environmental science, blending those together in a really beautiful way. So how you get to that is you go to the Good Medicine Way Facebook group at the top, you click on Browse and Events, and that'll be there for you to join through Zoom. And do you want to talk about the men's? All right, men's group, we're going to be uh going into another book. Yep, we just finished up uh, Mission and the Cultural Other. Now we're going to go into Pagan Christianity. And very interesting book. And it's really only the, the primer for two other books that Frank Viola has written. So just to read this one alone is kind of leaving out I think that we'll get to those books later. But those books lead into how we can live out what we learned from the Pagan Christianity book. So that's going to be happening here next month. So we're going to take a little bit of a break from that. And then on October 27th, we're going to be 7 p.m. Or 24th? October 20, I'm sorry, October 24th. That 27th, I'm going to mind for something <laughs> here. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. that's, our, that's our staff meeting, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, October 24th book group or, and is open for men and women uh, give you a chance to get a hold of the book find it and then we'll start putting up the how to connect with us and, and if you want to get a primer on a lot of what this book is about you can go to paganchristianity.org and you can see uh, a lot of information that has already been uh, said about this book all the conflicts and controversies over it and basically it's been uh, can't deny, but the facts are in the book, well documented and everything. So uh, that's coming. Let's see. It's, it came out, I think, in, in uh, 2008. So it's got a, it's got a little reputation behind it. So enjoy it as you start. You can start reading it, and then you'll make sure you jot down your questions as you go and and, and responses too. Uh, we always say we got question and response because we never say we have the answers. <laughs> so I like to have people share what they're they're doing. And so in this in this group, we're going to be uh, just you read it first, come to the the evening, and then we talk about it. And we'll have questions to kind of get us started and probing questions. And you can also bring your own. Uh, I know in Leah's uh, book group, they read the book. In, in their session at there. So it's gonna be a little different on this one. A lot of time for a lot of time for discussion. So that's it with that book. And we got Laura is gonna come up here and have another announcement. Yat Ed Anaso. I am very happy and joyous to share with you our um, the results of our Sewing 101 
how to sew a ribbon skirt and I wanted to um, show you the results through pictures. And here we go. Perfect. So this is a very short PowerPoint of pictures, but on Saturday, several days ago, Good Medicine Way hosted this Sewing 101 for our Native community. And <clears throat> we had a, a very positive response for this event. And kind of putting evaluation right up front. <laughs> What the women said, some said it was awesome, it was cool, it was fun. And then the next day, Sunday, I received a text from one of our participants who said, thank you again for yesterday's class. I just wanted to share the skirt I made with my daughter this afternoon. And she sent me a picture through, through text, so she was already motivated to make her second skirt. Teamwork. So we had 12 women attend, and they came from Albuquerque, the Pueblo of Laguna, and Laguna is situated on the west side of Albuquerque, and it is about a 45-minute drive one way. And then we had two individuals come from Berlin, and Berlin is south of Albuquerque, and that is about... 40 minutes, 30 minutes, about half an hour uh, south of Albuquerque. And um, seven out of the 12 women, which actually I need to change that number because nine out of the 12 women operated a sewing machine for the very first time, and that was amazing. Um, and then we also had additional helpers, so five of the former participants from my previous classes served as sewing mentors. And, you'll see that in action. And then I help facilitate the session. And again, this was Good Medicine Way's third Sewing 101 for our Native community here in Albuquerque. So here's a couple of pictures. The picture on your left is a mother-granddaughter -grand team. And the picture on the right is the person on the right of that picture. She's a new participant and the one who's helping to measure, that's Shandine, that's one of our daughters who's helping. And then here again, now they're working on the sewing machines and the, the, the ladies who are sitting at the sewing machine, they're the first timers. You know, they're two out of the nine first timers. And the picture on the right, in the background, um, is two other ladies who came. Actually, I should also say one other person came from Santo Domingo, Pueblo, which is about 30, 40 minutes north of Albuquerque. And the one in the back, in the black blouse, that's my sister. So I recruited her. <laughs> Uh, here's a picture, and here again are two ladies who um, are working on their sewing machines for the first time. The one person, the one lady on the right, this is her sewing machine, but she hadn't used it for years and years and years because when she got here, she it was it was covered with dust. <laughs> <laughs> so we helped her get situated, and here's the finished dresses, the finished skirts. There. So happy, um, you just cannot buy this type of expression anywhere, and it just comes from within, and that's what just blesses my heart. Um, the picture on the left is the grandma and the granddaughter. Um, she, the granddaughter made the skirt for herself, 
and then the picture on the right is my sister and um, so she's she's a happy one too uh, the picture on the left um, the daughter in the middle her mom is the one on the right and the mom's sister is the one on the left so we had um, a daughter a mother and an aunt who attended and then the picture on the right are two other ladies and they're the ones who travel from Laguna and again it's about 45 minutes west of Albuquerque and while I was putting this PowerPoint together and this is another person McKaylee she's 19 years old she is just bubbly and full of joy as you can see but as I was putting this PowerPoint together this afternoon Proverbs 31 just you know touch my heart and it says here <clears throat> she selects wool and flax and works with eager hands she sets about her work vigorously her arms are strong for her task she is clothed, clothed with strength and dignity she can laugh at the days to come give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise at the city gate And ultimately, why do we do what we do? Why are we doing Sewing 101? It's one way that we can fulfill our mission here at Good Medicine Way, which is together we strive to create authentic, trust-centered relationships that cultivate a circle of believers and creator sets free through ministry among our Native American family, friends, and relatives. And this last slide, I want to um, share a shout out to many people, and especially within our Good Medicine Way Zoom family, Helen Wright and Jean Stevenson. Um, they graciously donated toward this event, plus the New Mexico United Methodist Church New Church Development, James and Judith Kovalik, Roberta Begay, Laverne Wilson, Shandine Church, Alilaba Garcia, McKaylee Two Hatchet, Nikki Castillo, Marilyn Kreiler, and Sherry Birch, who is the president of the St. Paul the United Methodist Church, United Women in Faith. So overall, I also want to express my gratitude to the Good Medicine Way team who helped um, serve. We're the background people. Um, we do this for our community out of love. This is a way I feel like I can myself contribute back to our Native community um, with teachings. Um, I'm. I get messages off and on of saying, when are you gonna have another Sewing 101 class? And the little dual team with the granddaughter and the grandmother. The grandmother now says she wants to make a skirt for herself. So um, we'll see what happens next. But you know, we couldn't do this without your support, your prayers, your encouragement. Um, and you're giving in ways that you can so I just want to express my gratitude for that and um, we'll see what happens next in the future thank you yeah. you did a good job <laughs> <Woo -hoo. coughs> so let's see announcements any more smoke signals out there oh, they're here there anyway well we could go to the giveaway time here. Uh, the giveaway time is if you'd like to bless the work of Good Medicine Way financially. We're going to have a QR code blanket up here for you to take a picture of. You can donate that way or you can go to, again, our Good Medicine Way Facebook group. And at the top, there's a logo to click on to donate through PayPal or with other cards. Or you can message us on Facebook if you have other ways you'd like to donate and as you pray for the ministry of good medicine way 
uh, pray and you you know you can let us know if if in your heart there's other ways you you feel like you'd like to to give uh, through maybe some talent or skill of yours definitely let us know and and another just reminder that especially during the giveaway time if people have a a song uh, you know that they'd like to uh, perform that's a good time for those kind of songs to come forth and that is what we will do as we continue to worship here yeah today for the giveaway song we're actually going to uh play if you didn't know terry wildman and his wife are actually musicians and they call themselves rain song when they're performing and uh they did a they did songs that went along with the um the creator came down story and so we're going to play one of those and the video is kind of nice it shows like all the uh, it uses illustrations from the book so if you just want to search for rain song uh, creator came down uh, you'll find it on YouTube and, and you can see all the all the illustrations from the book and not just our uh, QR code but anyway Here's the song. When the Creator came down, the angel Gabriel found a virgin so bold, a prophecy foretold. Creator came down when the Creator came down. There was trouble to be found. Angry Herod had a scheme. Troubled Joseph had a dream. When the Creator came down. When the Creator came down There were angels all around Shepherds and sheep Wise men from the east When the Creator came down Rejoice, rejoice let heaven and earth resound. Rejoice, rejoice, Creator has come down. When the Creator came down, the story is so profound. A star showed the way to where the baby lay. When the Creator came down When the Creator came down All creation heard the sound The heavens and the earth rejoiced at His birth When the Creator came down Rejoice, rejoice, let heaven and earth resound. Rejoice, rejoice, Creator has come down. Rejoice, rejoice, let heaven and earth resound. Rejoice, rejoice, Creator has come down. 
Thank you, Grovers. <clears throat> but also thank you to the Wildmans being able to pull to give us that great song. Um, next up, we will have our words. So sadly, we will not be reading from First Nations version, but I'll let our reader explain that. Take it away, Namar. How y'all doing this evening? Good, can you all hear me okay? Good. All right. all right, just so you know, this is not a cigar. This is a Slim Jim. I, I quit smoking many years ago. All right. Okay, so we're going to be reading from the word of Psalm 137, verse 4. Are you all with me? All right. Okay, so let us read. Psalm 137, verse 4. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? Aho. Thank you, Namar. <laughs> hmm? Very, very powerful words. So, with that, we'll use that to segue into our Native American food time. We want you to think about these words and be able to have them reflect on what do they mean to you on how if you were to bring the songs to your former relatives or your ancestors. Take it away, Brian. Right, I'm going to be introducing our speaker tonight, Larry Jett. He came into our lives a few years ago and has been a part and become family now, a good brother in Christ. We Together we put on a camp there in Virginia uh, along with the uh, Troy Kelly Atkins and, and River Church and it came off really well. Uh, beautiful area, only thing about it hot <laughs> it was very hot but yeah but we had a great time it was first time we took a wachoni style family camp to virginia and with the help of larry gent he made that all possible larry's quite a renaissance man as you can tell by the all the musical instruments in the back there he does video he's a pastor a retired pastor now and he was at the wachoni symposium this year and the theme of this symposium this year had to do with ethnomusicology. And it's a big word that means many things, and a lot of people had different 
expressions of it in their presentations. And Larry is going to share with us one of those presentations and things that he brought out in his class. And I was, I was privileged to be in his class at this time and introduce him there as well. So Larry, uh, this is your time. Welcome, Larry Gent. First of all, I'm, I'm honored to be with Casey and Laura and the rest of the ministry team. Uh, I'm especially honored to be following so close on the coattails of Jay Goins, who spoke last week, and I hope I'm blessed enough to carry on a little bit of his message. I'm also honored to be with all of you all who are carrying the good medicine way forward. Uh, I don't have to tell you how this works because you all understand this. I, I have found in parts of Indian country that I've never been to, in a room full of people I've never met, if somebody mentions my name, six people around them will go, oh, that's Larry Gent. Yeah, he, he, he's in Virginia. Yeah, he, I know him. Well, it's kind of that way with, with uh, hanging out with you people because all around Turtle Island, I've heard people talking about the new things God is doing. And one of the things they say is, there's this church, this movement out. I think the pastor's name is church and it, it's Medicine Way or something. Good Medicine Way. It's Good Medicine Way, y'all. Uh, and so folks from all over Turtle Island are, are aware of what you're doing and celebrating it, and I honor you for that. Uh, I want to bring you greetings from my relations. Um, my roots run deep in the Appalachian and Allegheny Mountains of the southeast and underneath them into the veins of coal. My family followed the coal mines west rather than follow the path of removal. Um, my family is a confluence of Cherokee, Shawnee, and Sauk people. Through my maternal grandmother, I learned the art of hospitality, uh, the power of matrilinealism forced on her as a single mother of five in the coal fields. Her table was always open and abundant and groaning. And anybody who happened by was a relative and was welcome at table. Uh, at her house, I learned the art of Appalachian storytelling. We called it swapping lies. But after I went to college, I found out it was an art form of Appalachian storytelling. Uh, and I learned how God placed jokes with melanin. Uh, my grandmother could pass for white. All of her sisters could pass for Latino or even black. And it never occurred to me as a, a kid to ask, how come? Because uh, it turns out the answer is God laughs when we try to nail him down. Uh, from my paternal grandparents, I learned how we handled our history and, and our identity in my family. My grandparents would take me, by the way, Grover, uh, yeah, Grover's, um, grandkids really are God's best idea. Granddaughters are the best of the best because they, they will come and cuddle up with you and let you read them a book and they'll lay their head on your shoulder and they'll say, I love you. And a grandson will come charging up to you and hit you with a fire truck. Bam. And it means the same thing, but it doesn't feel the same. So either way, get set to have the time of your lives. Uh, in any case, they would take me on car rides. I didn't care where we were going. I knew there'd be ice cream involved. It never occurred to me to ask, why do we always wind up at a historical Native American site? All I remembered was the ice cream. My grandfather would always turn to me somewhere on the trip and say, you know, son, we're Indians. And my grandmother would explain, she would say, shut up. 
And he would laugh and say, you know, son, she's Indian too. And she would explain further and she would say, I said, shut up. So I learned at a very early age, this would have been around 1960, 61. I learned who we were and that we do not talk about it. It took me half a lifetime to begin to understand why. And thanks to folks like Casey mentoring me, I've never shut up once I started talking about it. In our talk tonight, uh, I wanna talk about singing songs of Zion in a strange land. Um, it's, a, it's a strange land into which we've been moved both in time and space. And sometimes our, our songs feel out of joint. That's what makes them all the more important for survival. Native American hymns were a tool of survival, particularly during the time of removal. But this is not to suggest that indigenous people were simply victims of history. In fact, Native American music at that time and beyond helped to weave a cultural tapestry that is uniquely American, and it's compi comprised of three strands, black, white, and red, combining to form a vibrant culture. So I'll be discussing this art form from a context of the Southeast for two reasons. First, because that's who I am, that's where I'm from, and that's what I know best. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, this talk is drawn from a paper I did for Nates, and they had a word limit. And I ran out of words available before I could get out of the Southeast. So that's, that's where I'm staying. Maybe we'll do another paper next year. In Appalachia, scholars have long been aware of musical influences of the Europeans mingling with African contributions as evidenced by European instruments like the violin, the fiddle, and African instruments like the banjo. The fact that there was a third vibrant culture present and contributing has often been overlooked. Maybe that's because it didn't fit the narrative of the empty wilderness or vanishing Indians. Nevertheless, native culture is a crimson thread running through Appalachia and beyond like a rogue's yarn. And it's there if you pause to look for it. I'm going to get off script just a, a second and tell you a little about what I'm talking about. And it all comes down to Hmm, what do you reckon? It all comes down to that. Uh, you know that in the Southeast, we're famous for having barn dances and square dances. And at square dances, we dance in a circle. In Europe, they call it contra dancing and they dance in a square. But when they brought it to America, they started dancing in a circle. Hmm. Who do you reckon was here that was dancing in a circle? Who might have contributed to that? We can go on. In Europe, there are no log cabins. European settlers arrived here in the Southeast. Suddenly everybody knew how to build a log cabin. Hmm, who else was already living here in log cabins? Where do you reckon you're, so just take that thought pattern of where do you reckon this came from? And let's apply it to music. In the 19th and 20th centuries, musicologists came to the mountains to collect the songs of the hills. And most of those musicologists came with the preconception that the old ways of life, both Appalachian and native, were vanishing. So their work was not so much an effort to record vibrant culture 
as to put a gravestone on what they considered a vanishing history. Others came with a profit motive. Many Appalachian songs have been copyrighted by outsiders, but the fact that Native American people don't have their name on the liner notes does not mean they did not write them or that the person who claimed to write it didn't borrow heavily from Native people. The cultural influences that built that kind of music were mixed and even those who had no Native heritage were heavily influenced by that third vibrant culture. Uh, Brian and Leah, have you ever heard of musicians who had no Native blood who were heavily influenced by Native music? Hmm, reckon where that could have come from. So, when we examine the history of Native American hymns as tools of survival, it's first necessary to, uh, to talk about the cultural context, the religious context of the American frontier. I'm going to do something wild and crazy and try to start a screen share here. Sometimes my beloved MacBook gets a little wonky when I try to screen share. So, yeah, I'm actually ahead of myself there. We see it looks good from our end. Hey, good. When we talk about this confluence of culture, the first thing to talk about is the, the nature of Christianity at that time and place. There were, there were three big things. First, life is uncertain. Now, this was true for Native people, obviously. It was true for all people at that time and at that place. Life was uncertain. There's a better world coming. And third was most important to the preachers. There's only one way to get there. And most of the preachers said, my way. Well, as you look at those roots in the revival movement, you start looking at the way that Christianity spread through the Great Awakening and the camp meeting movement. You might be aware that the color slide I have there is, uh, is of the Seminole stomp dance. What you see in the background is a brush arbor that they would construct for stomp dances, for green corn dances, for various ceremonies, and simply to keep the summer heat off. On the American frontier, and this is a fact that's, that's often overlooked, on the American frontier, revivalists would often wait until the ceremonies were completed in those arbors and then simply move into them to do the brush arbor meetings that we, we saw on the frontier as a place of revival. Those revivals, and you see a, a picture of a brush arbor revival there in the back uh, on the lower right, that may have very well been constructed for a green corn dance or some other function. And they simply moved in Native people often hung around for both. The music would shift from tribal music to church music, but both camps heard both types of music at this one place. And often this was where Native communities were first introduced to, uh, whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself again, were first introduced to uh, Christianity. As we talk about the, the, the revival movement, we have to also talk about the ways that Christianity was 
a path toward healing. Now, you might be surprised at me saying that, but look, we know that the church in many ways has much to repent for, for its treatment of native people. And yet often the only place the native people had to turn for healing from those hurts was to Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus, you know that's not a bad place to start. It was the delivery system that was the problem. So when we talk about healing from abuse, healing from all kinds uh, of uh, mistreatment, there's an entire field of psychology that studies how to find recovery from trauma. And to sum it all up, there's a lot more suggestions than this, but the first point is you need to find a place of safety. You can't begin to heal from trauma when the trauma keeps going on. The second thing is you need to find a sense of sacred worth. You need to believe that you are worthy of healing. And on down the, the way, the third thing is, and this is the most important thing, to find a place of forgiveness. Now, there's a caveat here. So we, we talked about forgiveness in that prayer that Jesus taught just a few minutes ago. But to forgive doesn't mean to say, oh, it doesn't matter to me anymore that you hurt me so badly and the, the pain and the scars I still bear aren't important. That's not what forgiveness means. Forgiveness means to come to a place finally with the help of others where you can say, I am no longer waiting on the abuser to make me whole. The abuser has nothing I need to find wholeness. I have found healing somewhere else. And the abuser no longer owes me anything because that debt has already been paid. Finding that kind of healing and hope in a revival culture even with sometimes flawed theology, finding that, that kind of thing in the music of the revival culture provided a path for healing for our natives who might well have gone mad without that. I firmly believe that without them finding that healing and that sense of hope, that sense of hope in the midst of the trauma, that we wouldn't have the opportunity to be doing what we're doing today. So we stand on their shoulders. As we talk about hymns of hope, there's no question that Amazing Grace, let me see, Amazing Grace is the front runner. There's like Amazing Grace and then everything else. The Cherokee Nation embraced it as their own, and you know the story of John Newton, the slave trader who wrote the hymn after his conversion. That's well documented. Not so many people know that it was originally published without music. The song that was, the music that was added later that we all have come to know so well we don't know where it came from. We know it was called New Britain. We don't know why, we don't know where it came from. Some people think it's a Scottish or Irish folk song. Some people think it was first sung by slaves on the very ship that John Newton was piloting. Why, why would we think that? Well, it's because Celtic people and African people both favor a pentatonic scale. See, there was a reason for this slide. They both favor a pentatonic scale. Native Americans also favor a pentatonic scale. If you're not sure what that is, I'm gonna show you. 
How'd I do, Brian? That's all there is to a neighbor. I'm sure you, I'm sure you did great, but unfortunately, the uh, Zoom filters uh, <laughs> killed most of it. But but I, I okay, believe well, that's probably when I'm playing. <laughs> uh, Brian, you you've got the flute there. Play a pentatonic scale, right quick. It's easy on the uh, Native American flute because it's just all the notes on the flute. That sounded very much like mine, except you've got reverb going on and I don't. Uh, so thank you, Brian. That's, that's a pentatonic scale. Celtic, African, and Native American peoples all favor the, uh, the pentatonic scale. And that's one reason that the melody of Amazing Grace has resonated so much with people of all ethnic backgrounds, but especially those whose heart language is written in that pentatonic scale. When it came time for the Cherokee to bring amazing grace into their heart language, they translated it into Cherokee, but they did not translate it word for word with the English. Now this is not for want of vocabulary. The Cherokee language has just as many words in it as English does. They could have done a literal translation. They chose to do their own translation. And I'll tip my hat, hand a little bit and say, lots of other Native American nations also did this with other hymns that they translated. And the, uh, the folks, the missionaries who went with them had just a cursory knowledge of their native language. They didn't realize that they were changing the language. So let's look at that a second. God's son paid for us, now to heaven he went after paying for us. Let's pause just a second there. One thing that's missing is an unsaved wretch. It starts off with grace. It starts out with atonement. It, there, there's no miserable wretch stuff there. All the world will end when he returns. We will all see him hear the world over. Remember, this is coming out of that second great awakening movement. This is the common understanding. There is a, an end of the world. The righteous who live, he will come after in heaven now always. In peace, they will live. Once again, there's a goal to look forward to. That's important in finding healing is to find a goal that you're moving toward. I'm not stuck here. And finally, once again, the first verse, God's son paid for us. Now to heaven he went after paying for us. God's son paid for us. Let me say it again, because I can't overstate this. They could have translated this word for word from English. They chose not to. So it's immediately apparent if you study those words that, let me back up here for you, that grace is present, but the singer is not amazed by it. The singer accepts that grace as something natural in the, the relationship between creator and the people. There is safety and assurance. Remember, that's part of finding healing. Safety and assurance simply in being in God's hand and being one of the real people. There is the theological claim of a better world to come, but there is no hint of getting even with those who have come before. There's no hint of settling the score because the payment has already been made. 
you see that that sense of healing and forgiveness of you got nothing I need. We're moving on. We're not stuck in the habit of being victims. We're going to uh, shift for a moment a little bit farther south than southeast to our friends, the Choctaw. The Choctaw were deeply spiritual people with a strong singing tradition. And yet, in the face of genocide, Christianity spread like wildfire through the Choctaw Nation. Maybe that's because it offered a framework for spiritual connection as the old ways were being dislocated and fractured. One of the first books, like Cherokee, one of the first books published in their own language was the Choctaw Hymnal. And the hymns in that book, like the Cherokee Hymnal, were sung on the Trail of Tears as hymns of survival. Direct translation of the Choctaw hymns can be challenging. Like modern powwow songs, the hymns of many Native people have vocables. That is, not so much words as emotional sounds. That's not to suggest that vocables have no meaning to the community that is singing them. So it's like the Hebrew word selah in the Psalms. The meaning of selah is uncertain, but it's not without significance. The vocables are invitations for the singer to attach their emotions with groanings too deep for words. Let me go back to trying to share again. There we go. The Choctaw hymns spread so thoroughly through the community that to this day, all somebody has to do is call out the page number of the song that was uh, uh, the, the page number that was originally ascribed to that song in that first hymnal, and everybody knows what it is. This one is, O Holy Spirit, you must surely come. You, we who are poor in spirit, you will gladden our spirit. Come and awaken, come upon us. Come and awaken our heart that is asleep. Whoops, that's not it. Come and awaken our hearts that are asleep. You alone can comfort us. That is a plea for you. Now, it might not be immediately apparent, but there's a significant theological claim here related to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Dominant European theology has been shaped by adherence to Roman philosophy. And it's not scripture, it's Roman philosophy where we get things like omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, all of those things are philosophical constructs. Much of American Christianity draws its theology in a direct line back to that Roman philosophy, but it's a mistake to think that that's the only orthodoxy that was ever at work and the only one we can turn to as believers today. In the early days of the Jesus way, the center of theology and science was not Rome, but Alexandria. That means the center of theology in the early church was not in Europe, but Africa. Let me say that again. In the days of the early church, the center of theology and learning was not in Europe, but Africa. You reckon that could change perspectives? African spirituality is not bound by Roman philosophical constraints. As African rituals, whether they're indigenous or Christian, 
often employ music, drum, and chants to call upon the spirit to fall upon believers. Now, this troubles Europeans because they claim God is omnipresent, already there 100%. So there's no need for, as, for asking God to come down or asking God to show up. Certainly no need to ask God to infill because God is already 100% present all the time. That moment of infilling is something that in African theology, much like Native American culture, it, it's a moment that can be ecstatic or transcendent, but the faithful expect to see and feel power come upon them. Human personality might be overshadowed. This expectation to receive the power of the Holy Spirit is right there in the Old Testament where the original members of the Sanhedrin, remember what the Sanhedrin became by Jesus' time? The original members of the Sanhedrin were chosen because the Spirit fell upon them and they fell out with the power of the Spirit. Even the ones who didn't come to the public ceremony fell out wherever they were. And that infilling of the Spirit became the mark of authority for the community. It's how they recognized that the Holy Spirit was present in those people. Now, the early missionaries had some trouble with their own theories about the omnipresence of God. They taught that God was always omnipresent in all times and places, but that God wasn't present on Turtle Island until they showed up to say so. I can't quite explain that, but that was a, a common way that they taught omnipresence to the native people. Here, here's the rub. If, you're, if native people started using call and response chanting and drumming with non-European words at non-European ceremonies, many native preachers have been taught that power has to be evil, can't be from God, because God wouldn't behave that way. Well, if you have a more ancient orthodoxy to, to help you understand that yes, this very much is part of Judeo-Christian tradition. Then you understand that there is nothing wrong with the kind of ceremonies, the kind of chanting, and the kind of visions that we have. Well, that's enough for the theological tall weeds for the moment. Let's turn back to musicology. We covered the pentatonic scale. Ryan covered it for me since I couldn't play it for you. Many native songs are pentatonic, but they are written in the minor pentatonic key. Now it's the same notes. It's the same notes. The notes don't change, just the starting and ending point on the scale change. And you think, well, that's not any difference, is it? If you think of the sound of Amazing Grace versus I am a poor wayfaring stranger. That's the difference in feel. To the European ear, minor songs are considered to be sad or angry or even dangerous. For other cultures, that's not true. It's Yom Kippur, hallelujah. Uh, Yiddish klezmer bands are always writing songs in minor keys, but they're always celebrating. Russian music is frequently minor, but it's always resolute. The same can be true of traditional Native American music. Although it's often minor, it's not so much sad as haunting, and it's not so much mournful as mystical. Many of those 
Native American songs traditionally were performed in a very slow and stately manner, so slow that it was almost without meter. Europeans heard that as something that ought to be fixed, dadgummit. It ought to be fixed. They said that indigenous music was either depressing or angry or dangerous. And this was considered to be evidence of their inferior spirituality and, and relationship with God. Minor songs, minor keys. How serious can this be? It's this serious. The ghost dance movement was outlawed and put down with deadly force, at least in part because outsiders found the music to be too sad and scary. If the dancers at the ghost dance shuffling along to that sad and scary music experienced infilling with spiritual power, that scared them even more. That was one of the biggest reasons they called for the movement to be put down with deadly force. So from our point of view, songs like these are an invitation to take all of your hurt, all of your scars, all of your pain directly to the creator. I guess a simpler way to say it is, sometimes you gotta sing the blues to feel good. Even though the blues are written in minor key, they're not sad, they're resolute. Sometimes you gotta sing the blues to feel good. Now, blues would be a whole different paper, a whole different topic. We're just beginning to get scholars researching and showing the Native American roots that help form the blues. Blues is a peculiarly American art form. And once again, it's long been documented that it was a, a mingling of black and white musical culture. But the more that researchers are looking, the more they find out there were three cultures present forming the blues. So again, I say, sometimes native people gotta sing the blues to feel better. Well, as we talk about the ways that native American culture helped weave that tapestry and create a whole new culture where native expression is part of our, our cultural uh, setting. We wanna talk about just a little bit how native culture even away from tribal grounds continues to this day to fuel creative engines. The native, uh, the native uh, I'm sorry, the Indian Removal Act did not remove all native people, especially here in the mountains. People with mixed marriages stayed and those in isolated outposts were just too hard to find. So there were a lot of lives lost through removal. It was usually more deadly than several wars combined. And the world is still impoverished today by the, la uh, by the loss of people along the way. But ideas are harder to kill than people. And musical expression may be the most powerful artistic idea at all. Much of the music that flows in the Southeast to this day still has Native American influence showing through it. So just as one small example, I want you to consider a well-known Christmas carol, I Wonder As I Wander. According to the liner notes, this was 
written, if you scratch it a little bit, you find out, no, it was collected by a fellow in Murphy, North Carolina. Now, Murphy, North Carolina is where the Eastern band of the Cherokee Indians lives. And I wonder as I wander, let's just look at that just a second, share screen. I'm old, I have to talk myself through these prompts. There we go. I wonder as I wander out under the sky how Jesus our savior did come for to die for poor ornery people like you and like I, I wonder as I wander. Listen, if Jesus had wanted for any wee thing, a star in the sky or a bird on the wing. Now, what does it mean when creator sets free, can wish for anything, anything under God's sky and, and what creator wishes for, what Jesus wishes for is, an, is a bird on the wing. It's just significant that there is this sense of wondering and wandering and birds on the wing. Let's see. It turns out in most native belief, birds on the wing are not just birds. Birds on the wing are spirit messengers. So isn't it curious that this song written in a minor pentatonic key is talking about rootless wandering and wandering. Now, a lot of people feel rootless wandering and wandering. We can't claim that that's solely a Native American event, a Native American feeling, but this sense of rootlessness is part of the Native American experience. You might know the popular song, Tumbleweed, by Bill Miller. Tumbleweed remembers how the West was won and lost, Homestead Act and the D Dust Bowl, everybody paid the cost. Tumbleweed keeps rolling, he just roams from town to town, ain't easy for a half-breed kid to try and settle down. The desert wind blows Tumbleweed like some spirit of the West. Oh, by the way, this is written in a minor key. It's a modern Native American song, and it's also expressing that sense of, of wistfulness and of wanting to roll with the wind. It's been almost 200 years since the uh, Removal Act was signed, but that spirit of unsettled wondering and wandering is still part of native experience. So could it be just a coincidence that that song came from a tribal ground? Well, I don't think so. I, I think it was borrowed pretty heavily, but let's consider another case. Maybe you know the hymn, The Lone Wild Bird. It was collected in Bladen County, North Carolina, which is home to the Lumbee tribe and the Tuscarora Nation. North Carolina, in spite of all their efforts at removal, still has more Indians than any state east of the Mississippi. And the person who collected this song was born in the midst of that tribal pocket. It would have been impossible for him to grow up without any kind of Native American influence. It might have been impossible for him to grow up without hearing a Native American singer who just might have been the one who actually penned these words. The Lone Wild Bird, wait, are we back at Lone Wild Birds again? The lone wild bird in lofty flight is still with thee, nor leaves thy sight, and I am thine, I rest in thee. Who's he calling to? Great spirit, come and rest in me. 
Uh, Native Americans might not have invented the term great spirit, but we sure do use it a lot more than, than other folks do, don't we? So I'm thinking that if you take all of this together, there's evidence wherever you look for ways that Native American culture is not just some backwater eddy that we're trying to maintain, but an active, vibrant, thriving culture that is still building art forms today if people have eyes and ears to look for it. So let's look at the conclusions. I'm bringing this full circle. The hymns of hope that our ancestors sang are the roots of our indigenous worship today. Without their survival in these hymns of hope, we would not be doing contextual work today. Those hymns of hope shaped musical traditions in the past, and they continue to shape traditions as we go forward. So Native American culture did more than just survive, more than just hunker down. It shaped traditions to this day and continues to make vibrant cultural contributions that are available for all who learn to look and listen. I'm gonna be still and listen to your reflections and your thoughts, but uh, Brian, I'm not going to try to play the flute because Zoom doesn't like it, but I'm going to give you a moment to reflect as I sing. Ooh, That, that song was good for our reflection time. I'm kind of feeling that way. Yeah, that's <laughs> fine. That was fine. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, so we can uh, open it up for uh, questions and comments. Uh, I'll just start a little bit. Just uh, while you were talking, I was reminded that um, a few years back there was this documentary uh, called Rumble. Um, after the Link Ray song um, that kind of traced native influence in modern American music and uh, Pura Fey from the group Lulali who's also from the southeast um, I think she's Cherokee I'm not sure of her lineage but she's definitely from the southeast okay and she talked a lot about how a lot of the the melodies that we now associate as kind of like black gospel melodies actually have native roots and that it was from the interaction between natives and the slaves in the southeast um, that these melodies kind of started becoming used among uh, the slave people for their different songs. Um, and then that kind of made its way into the music, but somehow when, like you said, when people were documenting it, somehow the, the red influence uh, got left out of the picture. Uh, but yeah, so if you're, so that's not just Larry's crazy idea. There is, there is, a, there is a lot of uh, support behind that. But yeah, if you're interested in that, I would, I would definitely suggest to uh, take a look at the, the documentary Rumble because um, it talks a lot about that too. 
song Rumble has no lyrics and it is the only instrumental song ever banned for inciting insurrection and it's played by an Indian. Hmm. Does that sound a little like the ghost dance movement where just the sound of the music sounded that dangerous? Hmm. Yeah, I've never made that connection before, but that's, yeah, that's so true. So true. All right, Helen, go ahead. Well, thank you for sharing with us tonight. And I remember you mentioned the spirituality of the Choctaw people in your talk. And I had come across that before. Are you familiar with a sculpture called Kindred Spirits? Yeah, it's in my paper, by the way. We I'll bet. Have... <laughs> I don't want to steal your thunder if you want to tell the story. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, I, I just want you to know I'll be sending you the link to my paper. There's more stuff there that's not, uh, more stuff that's on the cutting room floor. I wanted uh -huh. to get you home before bedtime. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, what amazed me was that the Choctaw people, despite the removal and their persecution, they heard about the starving people in Ireland in the famine. They raised a donation and they sent money as relief in 1847. And there is a commemorative statue in the county of Cork um, commemorating that and honoring the Choctaw nation. And I remember that just blew me away. I thought, if anything... I, I would have thought they would have just thought been so traumatized that they could only think of themselves, but they were thinking of other people. Mm -hmm. And I thought, now that's the example of Christianity that we need to follow. And I did hear something positive that during COVID, the Irish nation remembered that and they reached out to, I think the Choctaw, but they realized, I think the Lakota and the Navajo needed help more and they sent relief efforts, but I thought that's the kind of world we need to be building. Sounds a lot like asset-based theology. Though. Yes, it does. Yes. Larry, I thought it was really fascinating. I have always favored minor music. Um, I am most ministered by my minor music. And then to find out that that is the tones of our heritage. And I have Black African in me as well. Although I won't like it. Um, it, it's amazing to me that that's why it's so deep and reaches me so much. I thought that was really fascinating. And could you repeat the three aspects of the Roman philosophy, the anti uh, uh, omnipresent, and then I didn't catch the other two. You just take omni and add anything to it. The Romans wanted to put omni on everything. It's omniscient, omnipotent, om omnipresent. Um, it means immutable, unchanging. Uh, means uh, what is, is, and always shall be. Right. Thank you. Sure. It was very edifying. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, the history of Christianity for the first 300 years before Rome uh, circumvented it and co-opted it um, is a very different history than what the uh, Roman uh, church passed down to Europe. Um, so it's looking at that the pre-Constantine um, church history and records and writings. It's, it's a, some pretty fascinating stuff. The Nate symposiums that we go to for the last 20 years have expressed this contextual movement in from an indigenous perspective of theology, so much so that we got we got topics on every topic that you can think of, and the symposiums have just expanded those so much. Like this is just one of a, a dozen programs that were done in in uh, Winnipeg 
that just exploded everybody's mind to think of music in other cultures expressing Christ is just you guys missed out on a lot. I would suggest if you get a chance and you can come to a Nate symposium or even reflect and get the books that we've already written, that they're there and they're just they're mind blowing just to think of all just like with uh, Larry here, just ex you know, showing all of this right now to us, all of the books that we've written already have just opened opened up so much of the contextual movement that the, the white Western world <laughs> don't see in us. They just don't can't grasp that, yeah, we have a, a particular way that we can come to the Lord and understand him. It doesn't have to be from a white Western you know, way of doing it. I just want to share that. <laughs> Thank you, Casey. I'm blessed that you've shown that to me. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, <laughs> Uh, thank you, Larry, for your your time and your words with us tonight. Um, I they're good words. I I appreciate them. I appreciated them at Nate's as well. Um, could could you read us again um, your definition of healing? So there's there's uh, if I just started by googling trauma and recovery from trauma. And everybody, you can't shake a tree without getting somebody to fall out with a list of things you need to do in order to, uh, in order to find healing. Um, and um, so what I did was I took a synopsis of all those lists. Some of them were 25, 30 steps. Some of them were two or three uh, but the first step is to always find a place of safety. And, you know, as a pastoral counselor, this is something I've had to, had to talk about with folks who were being physically and sexually abused is you can't keep on staying in the situation and hoping that it'll change. That's Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing and hoping it'll work out different. You got to find a place of safety. Um, and the second thing is you have to believe that you're worth healing. It's an amazing thing about abuse is that it always affects the person who is abused to feel like I'm not worthy of getting better than this. I'm not worthy of getting through it. And the third thing is to finally find a place for forgiveness. Now, there's a, if you look at any of the authorities, they'll have a whole bunch of steps before you get to forgiveness, but it's something that we as believers claim to have reached all the time, and we haven't. We, we claim we've reached it every time we do the Lord's Prayer. And forgive as we forgive, there's not many of us that have reached that point. So that forgiveness is not getting to the point where we say the sexual abuse, the verbal abuse, the physical abuse, none of that hurts me anymore. I've still got car scars I carry from 60 years ago and I'm still forgiving every day. But what it does mean is I don't need you to fix me. I've got my own place of safety now, I've got my own people I trust, I've got my own folks who are helping me to find healing, and I don't need to wait on you to fix what you've done to me. Ba-bam! <laughs> that, that, yeah, that was a good, I, I appreciate those words, um, thank you again. Thank you, Joe. I'll chime in just a little bit on that because good medicine way 
one of the intents of having this program like we're having it here is that we have created a safe place where you can come and you are loved and your your thoughts and feelings and ideas are are worthy here you can share them and in and, and if they're if you don't have them quite figured out you know a lot of us don't you can start here to find ways to express them and hear other ways and then knowing that you are a person of sacred worth and that you are worthy of coming to healing you have to let that path begin in your life and sometimes it takes that forgiveness sometimes it's forgiving the out or accepting forgiveness that we got to have good medicine way is kind of based on those things right now this program is because we're we're so widespread with so many people from all around that I, and one time I says in our own particular areas we're misfits we don't quite fit in the the area that we go to or the church that we attend we sometimes we're afraid to speak up there because you know we'll be shot down because it doesn't go chime with the status quo but here you, you found you find a place of connection of, of worth and we love you for that Just wanted to say thanks, Larry. I heard it uh, in Winnipeg, except for you didn't come to Winnipeg. So, you know, the next time you have to actually come along so we don't just see you on a screen. But uh, your words were deep then and um, continue to resonate and just really, um, yeah, just hearing them again was actually really cool to let it sit and to just resonate. And so I just really appreciate uh, these insights that you're bringing from the Southwest. Um, or southeast, Joe's on southwest. I should watch which side of the U.S. I'm on. <laughs> and uh, from the center, you know, I'm in the central here. But um, anyway, it's just really powerful. And uh, so thank you for once again taking time to share with us. Thank you, Karen. You, you got me not in person, but coming from my basement that was full of boxes then. And as you can see, I'm starting to, to move into the new digs now. So... It Looks good. Looks much better than all the boxes, but <laughs> it's real. Oh, there, there's still plenty of boxes, but, you know, at least I've got space where I, I, I can go without them. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Namar. You're muted still, Lamar. Sorry about that. So first of all, again, as always, you know, want to give you thanks, Mr. Mr. Larry Gent. I really appreciate your words of wisdom and your teaching and your insight and your appreciation for the music. I think that music, and I could be wrong about this, but I think that that music is much more potent than we as the body of believers in Jesus Christ give credit. And I say that because when we go back to the very beginning, we remember that, that Satan, known as Lucifer at the time, was the minister of music. And think about all that he was able to influence by being a minister of music, think about all who has followed him while he was a minister of music. And when he had the iniquity, the thoughts to rebel against the Lord, all those that followed him. And I think that a big reason for that is he was able to influence many through, through music because music has been historically ordained by the Lord to enable us to connect with him. And, and as, as I read one of the Psalms, as I read Psalm 137, verse four, it just reminded me about how many of the Psalms that are written are actually musical, musical by David. And I think I'm guilty of this. I, I looked at the Psalm oftentimes as like poetry. And many of them are, don't get me wrong, but I've overlooked the fact that many of them are actually musical songs. 
And, and I think that music is, is an instrument that the creator has ordained to help us to encounter him, not just spiritually, but also very culturally. And I think that what you're teaching tonight, you are reminding us of how the creator loves to connect with us culturally, while at the same time, spiritually, all through music. Thank you, brother. That's, that's great to hear that that touched you in that way. Thank you. Go ahead and put a doc on. All right, uh, Larry, I would like to thank you for this, uh, for this wonderful sharing, especially the, uh, the emphasis of the music. Um, like music is what kind of um, connects everybody, connects all people wherever they come from. But um, I do have three questions for you. <laughs> uh, the first question is, um, how have these hymns of hope like made you feel like do they give you the hope um like um is there any particular hymn is there any particular hymn that has brought you uh like through a dark time in your life and uh what is your favorite song like what is your favorite hymn like yeah these are the questions i have <laughs> oh wow uh so yeah it's, uh, like a lot of musicians i have a a uh, constant song track playing in my head. Brian and Leah, do you do that? Uh, yeah, it's, and I never know what I'm gonna wake up to. I mean, it can be doo-wop, it can be classical, it can be, uh, you know, I, I don't know where it comes from. Uh, so I would have to say that my favorite hymn is the one that touches my heartstrings at the moment. Um, because I'm Appalachian and traditionalist at heart, uh, the ones that tend to touch me the most uh, tend tend to be things that it, they can they can be silly things, but they they touch me and my family from where we're at. Life is like a mountain railway is not a pinnacle of theological expression. Okay. <laughs> it's it's just not a great theological treatise but my daddy started working on the railroad laying track when he was 14 uh i started doing manual labor when i was 12 so keep your hand upon the throttle and your eye upon the rail you know it it reminds me of being a little boy my my granddaddy would do that the, the steam whistle with his hands, and he always wore the fire, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, railroad workers coveralls. He always had Prince Albert tobacco in that pocket right there. Uh, you know, those kind of things that touch my heartstrings mean a lot to me. And uh, frankly, that's, uh, that's what, here, I'll spin you around right quick. This is the room. Uh, that's why I've built this huge room in the basement because I want to bring people in who will never cross the doorway of a sanctuary. And I wanna bring them in and say, let, let's start singing and see if God warms your heart. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of secular songs that I think touch me uh, spiritually more than the hymns do. Um, but it's because they, they give me a taste of my past and the taste of my, my ancestors cheering me on. Uh, did I get to all three questions yet? I like your questions. Come, 
give give me your thoughts on the you answer those questions. Hey, um, hey, uh, well, I have a few. I have a few from different different uh different genres. Hey, <laughs> some things that help me get through my darkest days. Um, some uh like uh let's see, there is Amazing Grace, like like you know, hey, um, but there's also uh like like those songs that are in traditional like our heart languages right where we where we speak our language um but like they say certain things that I like to off of my heart you know and like uh, like obviously the psalms you know the psalms are amazing too uh some of them help me make it through the days um and uh, a particular hymn that really got me through a lot was amazing grace I have a whole story behind it of like how it how, how how these how these words in in like in the different tribal languages how they how they kind of uh, like how you said with some of them uh they don't trans they don't translate them word for word you know they translate them with how they feel about the words you know or how how the melody or how the songs make us feel you know so there there's a few hey there's a few <laughs> but yes I want to thank you again Larry that was that was amazing and it's making me think a lot now so I, I like I like the pentatonic right pentatonic minor or keys yeah that was something cool to learn so thank you thank you very much <laughs> thank you. And confession's good to the soul. Uh, I I don't think it's one of my favorite songs even, but I got to tell you, whenever Born to Be Wild comes on, everything stops. I I got to sing Born to Be Wild, you know. <laughs> Hi, I'm Linda, and um, I just walked off the road over here and I sat there for a minute and listened to what was going on in here and I heard God and and, and, and um scriptures and um just like I was led here because I was having a really hard time and I've been having a hard time but yesterday on a good note um one of the South Valley store owners uh was very sick and, ad and is very addicted to um uh fentanyl because of his um um medical issues and um and my heart went out to him like several times his brother told me that he was like to make it and I cried and I cried and then when I see him and I cried even more well and then I said he, he did it again and then I cried even more and then when I saw him I cried more and I haven't been to the valley I'm from the valley um I'm living over here in uh, Yale now in these apartments and um thank god I'm, I'm, I'm grateful I really am um but it's horrible, but I'm grateful to have a roof over my head and my all my doggies with me and um What's your name? I'm safe. Huh? What's your name? I said my name's Linda. Linda. Okay, yeah. I didn't hear. Oh <laughs> my name's Linda. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and um uh, in legacy in Paris, France, by the way. And um so anyways, um yesterday I haven't been to the mushrooms. It's the mushrooms and this these people if their grandparents owned it and um, their parents and now their sons are and they're Christians and they and they, and they love Jesus and well I walked in yesterday and I saw Phil and I said I, I, I didn't cry I didn't cry and I was just happy I was so happy to see him because I had asked his brother to let me go talk to him he said he's in the room and he won't come out and he won't see nobody let me go talk to him he says I can't but maybe something good will happen. Maybe he'll come on. I don't know. We'll see. But I doubt it. He says very doubtful. And I said, okay. And then yesterday I went over there and I hadn't been there for a month maybe. And he was there and I looked at. I was like, oh, you just spiritually like I had a spiritual awakening, you know, with seeing him standing there alive alive and standing up and out of the not in the in the other side of the counter but in this side of the counter never ever in as long as i lived ever seen him on this side of the counter excuse me i just ate some pizza and um so i was like happy and i'm an addict 
and I'm, and, I, and I don't know how to get out of it because I'm alone and my family disowned me and I'm a black sheep and I'm not trying to be a victim but I am a victim of circumstance. I'm trying to understand that and trying to make myself understand that so that I can get along with myself because all I have is myself and a lot of people take advantage of that and my kindness for weakness and well I when I sit back to Phil and I was like I was like overjoyed overwhelmed and just excited and like something came over me and I didn't know what I was going to do because my bike got flat and I just threw it to this guy and ended up with no bike before that they changed my bike before that they changed they stole two baskets of merchandise from me at the Dollar General and I lost a lot of my things because I shop in the valley and I spend a lot a couple hundred few hundred dollars and then I go home because I love to shop at the valley I love the valley people at those stores and the Smiths and you know, and so, but they, I was having, a, I was waiting for a ride three hours with my two little doggies because I got rid of them. I sent them to the dog pond because I couldn't handle them anymore. I couldn't keep chasing after them. I'm too old for them. But I can't handle, I can't handle, I can't. But I couldn't handle not being without, being without them. So I went back for, to, I went to the pound and I got them back. <laughs> I got my doggies back, my little okay. puppies. My hey. brother and sister and I named a little guy and babe, they named him Handsome and Gretel. <laughs> so that's on their chips, handsome and glad. So um, I was staying with the little guy and babe. Anyways, um, anyways, um, so I'm going through this craziness in this apartment complex because I needed one bedroom. I didn't want an apartment. I do houses, and I had to end up in the apartment. And long story short, when I saw Phil back to Phil, I said, "You really no way." I went outside. I, I, I sent a friend to get me cigarettes, and then I went to get. I went just over there just to go, and I was back. Went back where I was coming from. He hadn't even gone for my cigarettes yet. But when I was talking to Phil, I sat outside, and I put on my Christian music, and I listened. I, King of Country is my favorite, and and Lauren Daigle, and and Toby Mac, and, and and I love them all. You know, I just love them all. Every one of them songs just hits me, and it's me. It's it's all about me. It those songs are all about me because. I live that. I I want to live that. I have to. I, I I earn and I desire to live serving God. I want to sing and worship my children, my grandchildren in the streets. But that's not going to happen. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know because I have no family structure. But that's neither here, that's neither here nor there. What I'm trying to say is, when I saw Phil, I I wrote a cigarette. And I went back inside and I said, Phil, thank you, Leah. You have said me. Linda. Let's give the other oh, I'm sorry. a chance to speak. I thank knew you. I was going to talk over board. Okay. <laughs> well, let's <laughs> let's okay um, okay. let's we'll thank get, thank uh, Linda for something. coming. Thank Linda. We just like one thing that we mentioned here is that uh, that door is open, and when you came in, you're you're it's a safe place for you to come. You know, and I know that they already ministered to you already, and then we're going to minister you with some food too to take to take with you too. So everyone here, it's like that's it's a good med good medicine ways door. You know, when they, anybody walks in, we care for them. Yeah, you know, they just Thank they're you. here, and we don't know what the situation is, Thank you. but we just our thing is to do is we just got to love on them. Thank That's you. what it is. So we're, you're, you don't feel mad that you're here. You're here for a reason, and this group here. I'll just finish probably, my story next they'll, they'll be they'll be praying for you too. So thank you, well, please. thank thank Linda. Uh, I want to give it back over I to Brian here. Yeah. Yeah. We got another question. Any responses to that? Yeah. 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 That was for you. I just wanted to share that. That's good. You're you're welcome here. Thank you. You have a uh, a really uh, linguistically nerdy curiosity, Larry. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know if uh, if you can speak to it or not. But I noticed in the um, in the the translation of Amazing Grace how they kind of like bookended the thought and that's a that's a feature that I've seen in um, 
uh, indigenous languages in southern Siberia. And, you, and, and those languages, if they bookend the thought, it like is kind of like underscoring it and emphasizing it. Um, so like I noticed like in the first verse of the Amazing Grace, it was like, you know, um, you know, God paid for us few other things he did and then like God paid for us like like it's like they're like underscoring that aspect of it I don't know if you had any more insights uh, about that kind of linguistic feature or anything about the song uh, that that might play into if you look at the way that that is shaped when you get to that that verse that's repeated that would be the honor verse if it was powwow music so Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm assuming that everybody knows what the honor verse is. If, if it's powwow music, uh, Brian, you want to explain that? Oh, I mean, I don't know if I have the greatest understanding of it. Um, but yeah, but basically, when you repeat that line, that's like the important concept that you're giving honor to in the singing of the song. So that's so when you. When you emphasize it, that's the thing that's being held in, in honor. So, where you so yeah. raise your hand and you raise your staff, and these are, are more powerful, and you're yeah. honoring the ancestors as you're singing that verse again. Yeah, it sounds hey. like it's a Sorry, I was gonna say, yeah, Brian, you gotta, you gotta sing it like you're crying for your ancestors. Just kidding. <laughs> sing it with their tears. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's this Siberian song where they, uh, they, they sing it, and it's it's a song about honoring their culture and their heritage, and they 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 say the you know phrase like I am Tuvan is like how you translate it and they sing some stuff but then when they say it again it's like they're saying I am Tuvan I am and so like like they book end it and that like kind of underscores the fact that like I'm just not Tuvan like I'm thoroughly and completely and wholly a Tuvan person and so yeah so it, it looked like it was the same kind of book ending of, of thought kind of thing like uh, as a linguistic Function. But yeah, I like tying it into the the, the powwow um, kind of ways of doing things too. I think that all like fits together well. Thanks so much. Uh, I've been to the Bay of Alaska. I've served church up there at Homer, but that was far enough for me. I didn't make it to Siberia. <laughs> All right, any other uh, questions out there? Let me double check the, I don't see any on the online feeds. So last hey, one. since, since, uh, since Larry was uh, talking about powwow songs, I just put in the chat that, you know, powwow songs carry a lot of healing. They carry a lot of medicine with them. Um, when you enter, when you enter into that drum circle, when you're singing behind the singers, you know, you have to, you have to kind of conduct yourself in a, not so much a righteous manner, but more like a, like a good, like you come in a good way, you know, a lot of people go to their powwows and they put their feelings into the dancing, they put their feelings into that drum, and when they hear it, it, it not only awakens them and not only awakens their ancestor, like their ancestral bloodlines and not only like awakens like, like their joy, it, it brings out so much, so many different feelings, you know, you find people um, coming into the circle and they're, and, and they, they have different stresses that they worry about. They come into the circle and they have like different family things going on. They have different, like, like, other personal things that are happening around them but when you get into that circle and you're you're connected to that drum it's like 
it's like you can feel like creator's presence. He puts like a he puts a shield around you when you start dancing and you just kind of go into the music and you hear you hear what the what the ancestors are trying to tell you. And and it goes with a lot of different traditional songs too, like bear dance songs, board dance songs, um, the ghost dance songs that Larry was speaking about earlier. Um, so I, I thought it was really cool that he kind of touched touched a little a little bit on things that were considered forbidden these things that were considered too powerful you know not knowing that our indigenous people our our, our turtle islanders our our aboriginal people that we were already speaking with our creator we were already lifting up our prayers to creator you know, a lot of a lot of songs, you know, you hear you hear the words and they speak those words very clearly. You know, it's like it, it it's it's uplifting. It's amazing. You go into that dancing circle and you you go into the arena and like all of your problems are laid there. It's like going to the altar. It's like laying down your burdens for creator to take it and he'll take it and and make something better out of it. You know, and I thought that was very, very beautiful that Larry had shared something about that a little while ago um, that like, yeah, all these different songs, different meanings. Eh? And I'm really, really glad that Larry was was here to share um, musical like musical love, musical hope, musical survival, you know, so I want to thank you again, Larry. Eh? <laughs> but yes. <laughs> that none of the stuff you just said about creator coming upon you and none of that stuff came to you from traditional Roman theology. None of it. <laughs> you you got to look outside that stream to find that power. Yeah, that reminds me of what, what you were talking about in Petadaka. That kind of informs that Robbie Robertson song that's about the ghost dance, you know, when he says, you know, like the oppressors don't stand a chance against our prayers, but the fact that the native prayers are not just words, but that they are song and that they are dance, and that they are movement and action, you know, and that's, you know, there's, it's a, it's a whole new concept of prayer that doesn't come from that Roman uh, way of thinking that keeps it all static and dead on the paper but but prayers from a native perspective are alive and active as the scriptures say they should be so yeah i think that informs that really well all right any other last comments all right so we'll we'll move into our our closing song um, it, this is going to be a little bit of a lighthearted one, um, uh, since we were, you know, talking about that, you know, Creator Sets Free was probably actually born uh, in September, while well, there was one time when we were uh, talking about that, and uh, Preston had mentioned like, oh man, we should do like a, a, a contextualized little drummer boy song. Um, so if you remember from last year, we did this last year, but we, we took one of Jonathan Miracle's songs and we mashed it up with uh, the little drummer boy and away in the manger. Um, so I really want you all to enthusiastically sing along. Um, <laughs> you should be able to pick up on it pretty easily. But yes, big round of applause for Larry. Yay, thank you for your sharing. <laughs> Pum 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 p
actually really great <laughs> awesome i actually really enjoyed it so but next up we have open padadaka to give us um, closing blessings so let's open our hearts and our minds to um, blessings over the night oh kristen aho and brian I i'll have to admit i was kind of laughing a little bit because it's a nice, uh, it's a nice rendition. <laughs> so <laughs> I enjoyed it. <laughs> All right. Well, again, we want to thank Larry for coming uh, to speak to us tonight, sharing about our basically kind of like the Native American contribution to music and and the then the the hymns of hope that got our people through so many things, so many things. So yes, thank you, Larry. Thank you for your thank you for your words. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and uh, do the send off blessing. I want to thank Good Medicine Way for uh, entrusting me to uh, lift our prayers to Creator. So thank you, thank you. <laughs> creator, <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I come to you tonight just wanting to thank you for gathering each one of us here tonight. Um, I want to thank you for for this beautiful day and for the the transition into the fall that you've given us, Lord. Um, I want to ask a special blessing and special uh, special healing for all the all of our relatives who are dealing with uh, addiction problems, Lord. Um, I want to thank you for bringing Linda into into our into the sacred space, Lord. I want to thank you for um, my cousin, Rachel, who is also going through a, a, a moment of a healing from addiction, Lord. Um, and uh, I pray that you help us to uh, grow in our relativeship and, um, and restore our kinship with one another, Lord. Help us to be there for one another and, and to be able to, to lift prayers for one another, Lord. Um, I pray that you guide us into the resurgence and reclamation of our language and our traditional life ways, Lord, through these different songs and, and through these dances that we do, Lord. I just pray that you you help guide us to be able to reclaim what was what was stolen and what was lost. Spirit. I pray that you guide us and I pray that you lead us wherever you want us to be. Help us to continue singing our songs. May you guide us into hope as we continue to sing and ensure our survival and the survival of our people. Help us to move through the day with a song in our hearts, Lord. The ones that you the ones that you've given us, Lord. Help us to create new ones too, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that you uh, that you just continue to guide us into this week, Lord. Whatever we may be facing, I pray that you just place your healing hand over each one of us, Lord. Each one of our families, each one of our home fires, wherever we're calling in from, Lord. And I just pray that you that you hear that you hear our prayers, Lord. That you that you uh, make them according to your will. I ask all these things in your Son Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you everyone for showing, coming, being with us tonight. Thank you, Larry, once again. Hope to see you again somewhere down the road here. Uh, next week we're going to have Leah Grover going to be our speaker. So, some baby pictures over. Oh yeah, it's all going to be about grandma, grandpa, and baby pictures. So, <laughs> so 
what a blessing to be born this time. Yeah, it's wonderful. Congratulations. All right, everyone. I just want to send you off with blessings. We love you. Yeah, take care. Love you all. Thank you, Ray. Remember, you. you hear a good medicine way. You are loved. All right, we'll see you guys next week. <laughs> Bye. Preston! <laughs>